Hi everyone. The Vesa was a warship commissioned by King Gustavus Adolphus of Sweden during the early 17th century. The construction of the ship began in 1626 in Stockholm, and it was intended to be one of the most impressive vessels of its time. The king's ambition was to demonstrate the military might of Sweden and establish dominance in the Baltic region. During the 17th century, Sweden went from being a sparsely populated, poor, and peripheral northern European kingdom of little influence to one of the major powers in continental politics. Between 1611 and 1718 it was the dominant power in the Baltic, eventually gaining territory that encompassed the Baltic on all sides. This rise to prominence in international affairs and increase in military prowess, called Stormachtstiden, Age of Greatness or Great Power period, was made possible by a succession of able monarchs and the establishment of a powerful centralized government, supporting a highly efficient military organization. Swedish historians have described this as one of the more extreme examples of an early modern state using almost all of its available resources to wage war. The small northern kingdom transformed itself into a fiscal military state and one of the most militarized states in history. The Vesa has become a prominent symbol of Sweden's maritime heritage and serves as a testament to the ambitious naval aspirations of King Gustavus Adolphus. The ship's well-preserved state and its richly decorated exterior make it a unique and captivating historical artifact, attracting millions of visitors each year. Construction Just before Vesa was ordered, Dutch-born Henrik Hybertsen was shipwright at the Stockholm shipyard. On 16 January 1625, Master Henrik and business partner Arendt de Groot signed a contract to build four ships two with a keel of around 135 feet and two smaller ones of 108 feet. Master Henrik and Arendt de Groot began buying the raw materials needed for the first ships in 1625, purchasing timber from individual estates in Sweden as well as buying rough sawn planking in Riga, Königsberg, and Amsterdam. As they prepare to begin the first of the new ships in the autumn of 1625, Henrik corresponded with the king through Vice Admiral Klaas Fleming about which ship to build first. The loss of ten ships in the Bay of Riga led the king to propose building two ships of a new, medium size as a quick compromise, and he sent a specification for this, a ship which would be 120 feet, 37 meters long on the keel. Henrik declined, since he had already cut the timber for a large and a small ship. He laid the keel for a larger ship in late February or early March 1626. Master Henrik never saw Vesa completed, he fell ill in late 1625, and by the summer of 1626 he had handed over supervision of the work in the yard to another Dutch shipwright, Henrik Hein Jacobsen. After launching, work continued on finishing the upper deck, the stern castle, the beakhead and the rigging. Sweden had still not developed a sizable sailcloth industry, and material had to be ordered from abroad. The rigging was made entirely of hemp imported from Latvia through Riga. The king visited the shipyard in January 1628 and made what was probably his only visit aboard the ship. In the summer of 1628, the captain responsible for supervising construction of the ship, Sofring Hansen, arranged for the ship's stability to be demonstrated for Vice Admiral Fleming, who had recently arrived in Stockholm from Prussia. Thirty men ran back and forth across the upper deck to start the ship rolling, but the Admiral stopped the test after they had made only three trips, as he feared the ship would capsize. According to testimony by the ship's master, Joran Matson, Fleming remarked that he wished the king were at home. Gustavus Adolphus had been sending a steady stream of letters insisting that the ship be put to sea as soon as possible. Design and Stability 
the king ordered 72 24-pound guns for the ship on the 5th of August 1626, and this was too many to fit on a single gun deck. Since the king's order was issued less than five months after construction started, it would have come early enough for the second deck to be included in the design. The French galleon du guise, the ship used as a model for Vesa, according to Arendt de Groot, also had two gun decks. Laser measurements of Vesa's structure conducted in 2007 to 2011 confirmed that no major changes were implemented during construction, but that the center of gravity was too high. Vesa was an early example of a warship with two full gun decks. There is no evidence that Henrik Hybertson had ever built a ship like it before, and two gun decks is a much more complicated compromise between seaworthiness and firepower than a single gun deck. Armament Vesa was built during a time of transition in naval tactics, from an era when boarding was still one of the primary ways of fighting enemy ships to an era of the strictly organized ship of the line and a focus on victory through superior gunnery. Vesa was armed with powerful guns and built with a high stern, which would act as a firing platform in boarding actions. What made her arguably the most powerful warship of the time was the combined weight of shot that could be fired from the cannons of one side, 588 pounds. This was the largest concentration of artillery in a single warship in the Baltic at the time, perhaps in all of Northern Europe. This large amount of naval artillery was placed on a ship that was quite small relative to the armament carried. By comparison, USS Constitution, a frigate built by the United States 169 years after Vesa, had roughly the same firepower, but was over 700 tons. Vesa, though possessing a formidable battery, lacked a unified broadside with guns that were all aimed in roughly the same direction. The guns were intended to be fired independently and were arranged according to the curvature of the hull, so that the ship bristled with artillery in all directions, covering virtually all angles. What allowed Vesa to carry so much firepower was not merely that an unusually large number of guns were crammed into a relatively small ship, but also that the 46 main 24-pounder guns were of a new and standardized lightweight design. These were cast in a single series at the State Gun Foundry in Stockholm, under the direction of the Swiss-born founder Mededus Jessus. Two additional 24-pounders, of a heavier and older design, were mounted in the bows as boat chasers. Four more heavy guns were intended for the stern, but the Cannon Foundry could not cast guns as fast as the Navy Yard could build ships, and Vesa waited nearly a year after construction was finished for its armament. When the ship sailed in August 1628, eight of the planned armament of 72 guns had still not been delivered. All cannons during this time had to be made from individually made molds that could not be reused, but Vesa's guns had such uniform precision in their manufacturing that their primary dimensions varied by only a few millimeters, and their bores were almost exactly 5.7 inches. The remaining armament of Vesa consisted of eight three-pounders, six large caliber Storm Tycan for use during boarding actions, and two one-pound falconets. Also included on board were 1,971 pounds of gunpowder and over 1,000 shot of various types for the guns. Ornamentation As was the custom with warships at the time, Vesa was decorated with sculptures intended to glorify the authority, wisdom and martial prowess of the monarch and also to deride, taunt and intimidate the enemy. The sculptures made up a considerable part of the effort and cost of building the ship. The symbolism used in decorating the ship was mostly based on the Renaissance idealization of Roman and Greek antiquity, which had been imported from Italy through German and Dutch artists. Imagery borrowed from Mediterranean antiquity dominates the motifs, but also include figures from the Old Testament and even a few from ancient Egypt. Many of the figures are in Dutch grotesque style, depicting fantastic and frightening creatures, including mermaids, 
wild men, sea monsters and tritons. The decoration inside the ship is much sparser and is largely confined to the steerage and the great cabin, at the after end of the upper gun deck. Residues of paint have been found on many sculptures and on other parts of the ship. The entire ornamentation was once painted in vivid colors. The sides of the beakhead, the bulwarks, the roofs of the quarter galleries, and the background of the transom were all painted red, while the sculptures were decorated in bright colors, and the dazzling effect of these was in some places emphasized with gold leaf. The sculptures are carved out of oak, pine or linden, and many of the larger pieces, like the huge 9.8 foot long figurehead lion, consist of several parts carved individually and fitted together with bolts. Close to 500 sculptures, most of which are concentrated on the high stern and its galleries and on the beakhead, are found on the ship. The figure of Hercules appears as a pair of pendants, one younger and one older, on each side of the lower stern galleries. On the transom are biblical and nationalistic symbols and images. A particularly popular motif is the lion, which can be found as mascarons originally fitted on the insides of the gunport doors, grasping the royal coat of arms on either side, the figurehead, and even clinging to the top of the rudder. Each side of the beak head originally had 20 figures that depicted Roman emperors from Tiberius to Septimius Severus. Overall, almost all heroic and positive imagery is directly or indirectly identified with the king and was originally intended to glorify him as a wise and powerful ruler. The only actual portrait of the king is located at the very top of the transom in the stern. Here he is depicted as a young boy with long, flowing hair, being crowned by two griffins representing the king's father, Charles IX. The order to sail was the result of a combination of factors. The king, who was leading the army in Poland at the time of her maiden voyage, was impatient to see her take up her station as flagship of the reserve squadron at Alvesnaben in the Stockholm archipelago. At the same time the king's subordinates lacked the political courage to openly discuss the ship's problems or to have the maiden voyage postponed. On 10 August 1628, Captain Sofring Hansen ordered Vesa to depart on her maiden voyage to the naval station at Alvesnaben. The day was calm, and the only wind was a light breeze from the southwest. The ship was warped along the eastern waterfront of the city to the southern side of the harbor, where four sails were set, and the ship made way to the east. The gun ports were open, and the guns were out to fire a salute as the ship left Stockholm. As Vesa passed under the lee of the bluffs to the south, a gust of wind filled her sails, and she heeled suddenly to port. The sheets were cast off, and the ship slowly righted herself as the gust passed. At Tegelviken, where there is a gap in the bluffs, an even stronger gust again forced the ship onto her port side, this time pushing the open lower gun ports under the surface, allowing water to rush in onto the lower gun deck. The water building up on the deck quickly exceeded the ship's minimal writing ability, and water continued to pour in until it ran down into the hold. The ship swiftly sank to a depth of 105 feet only 390 feet from shore. Survivors clung to debris or the upper masts, which were still above the surface. Many nearby boats rushed to their aid, but despite these efforts and the short distance to land, 30 people reportedly perished with the ship. Vesa sank in full view of a crowd of hundreds, if not thousands, of mostly ordinary Stockholmers who had come to see the ship set sail. The crowd included foreign ambassadors, in effect spies of Gustavus Adolphus allies and enemies. The sinking of the Vesa was a tragic event. The ship, which was meant to be a symbol of Swedish naval power, became a humiliating failure for the king and his navy. 
For over three centuries, the vessel lay forgotten at the bottom of Stockholm's harbor. It was not until the mid-20th century that the ship was rediscovered. In 1956, a marine archaeologist named Anders Fronzen, driven by his fascination with the ship's history, located the wreck. A major salvage operation took place between 1959 and 1961 to recover the vase from the seabed. The ship was lifted to the surface and transported to a dedicated museum, the Vasa Museum, which opened in Stockholm in 1990. The Vasa, along with its artifacts and preserved hull, is now on display in the museum, providing valuable insights into 17th century shipbuilding techniques and life at sea. Thanks for watching.